The freight world, I am often told, is based on relationships. Not fancy backdoor meeting behind a pool table with cigars relationships, but ones built on trust and experience working together. But from my experience in trucking, it often felt like the term relationship was only used when the other party had to make a sacrifice. Do relationships in the freight industry matter, or are we not paying close enough attention to things such as price and competition? We'll find out, folks, in this episode of Loaded and Rolled. Welcome to Loaded and Rolling. I'm your host, Thomas Wasson. Relationships in the freight industry can be interesting to say the least. If you're a trucking company or a freight broker, it often begins by cold calling or spamming a shipper's email inbox, hoping to get your foot in the door for a few shipments. Like a flashy display by migratory birds, the cold call is a delicate dance where the carrier hopes to woo the distrustful shipper with flashy displays of things such as quality service, low rates, or my personal favorite, my business hasn't gone out of business yet, so please use me. Well, if they're lucky or large enough, they'll gain access to freight shipments and this budding freight relationship begins. But what happens when the market changes? Often it is a seesaw where a carrier or shipper gains pricing power, or do they remember those halcyon days when the sales rep brought the company a gift basket or an ornate mug? Or will they ruthlessly focus on price and service, then remind the other party that the relationship is what matters in spite of this betrayal? Luckily for us, there's actually a science behind this chaos, and the folks at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have studied both shipper and carrier behaviors to give us some insights. We'll go from dear John to dear science and learn what to look for when the marketplace turns. Joining us next is Angie Acachella, research affiliate with the MIT Center of Transportation and Logistics, and folks, she knows a thing or two about freight science. Welcome, Angie. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Pleasure to have you on. And the science behind it has always been so fascinating. I remember the first one I read back in 2020. Uh, it was called, actually, Elephants or Goldfish? An Empirical Analysis of Carrier Reciprocity and Dynamic Freight Markets. And this one focuses on the carrier. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what were some of the findings that you all uh, looked at when you were looking at this data? Yeah, so that was a really interesting one. We did that study kind of at the height of the last tight, tight market before COVID, right? So we were looking at, well, are carriers uh, remembering what shippers did in the past in the previous soft markets? Are they looking at, you know, how well was that carrier, uh, was that shipper in terms of offering de um, consistent demand, things like that? And then in that tight market, was that carrier then prioritizing that shipper's uh, freight. And so what we found was actually no, in fact, that that carriers were not responding particularly to shippers' previous performance, pre previous demand patterns, things like that, when they were making their freight acceptance decisions in the tight market. What they were predominantly focusing on was what was going on in that tight market. So how how uh, attractive was that shipper's freight during this, the tight market? How competitive were contract prices for that carrier during that tight market? Um, and so, you know, we found that shippers are, I have to really focus on what's going on today during those extreme markets in order to help get carriers to incentivize, to prioritize their business. I think that's such a fascinating point because whenever I worked at a large carrier, oftentimes, you know, with turnover and other things, the person who was there making the decisions in the last big market when the cycle swapped is now in another position. So it almost feels like these carriers, you mentioned goldfish. Was that one of the surprising things that uh, you all found out was just how much carriers can't really see far ahead or look very far behind? Yeah, I think what was nice about this study, what we were trying to do was there's a lot of conversation over what is the value of that relationship between shipper and carriers over time. Um, and so, yeah, we, we wanted to see, well, you know, are carriers kind of being more myopic in the way that they're making decisions? And kind of like you alluded to, there there are a lot, there's a lot of change in the transportation functions within both the shipper, the shipper side and the carrier side. And so those relationships that um, are maybe personal relationships are not as long lasting. 
um, the relationship kind of comes down to the, the how well that business fits more than kind of those personal things. Because like you said, people change pretty quickly in this industry. I felt like how the business fits was such a huge thing because shippers would always get frustrated on acceptance rates. How much load? Some would say 95%. Some would say I need you to accept 99%. And so I wonder if that's a situation where you know, if you're a shipper, should you focus more like on your rates when you lose the pricing power or should you find specific carriers that they tell you it's a better fit? Was there any strategies for shippers when they don't have the advantage of being a price setter? Yeah, I think that the main findings were around the demand variability or the lack of variability. So if you can find ways to smooth out your demand, whether that is maybe that means putting two carriers contracted on a lane and kind of smoothing the demand between different carriers um, or, you know, having more frequent demand by pooling demand between lanes, things like that. Um, those are, or even just finding out what specifically is your carrier looking for in that particular region on that particular lane, right? Understanding that your carrier's network can also help you identify how to make that business more attractive to them. I think another thing that you all touched on was topics like dwell and characteristics. I've seen it firsthand where folks that maybe are like a tire company or, you know, you see when we talk about high inventory levels, we forget a lot about what that means when the DC's full is your trailers are stuck. And so is that something where uh, did any of the data talk about how maybe customer characteristics can take a, a front seat in spite of maybe the higher rates? Yeah. Yeah. We looked across industries. The results didn't seem to, to change in terms of the, the shippers industries. Um, but like you said, dwell time was a big piece of it, particularly the, the drop-off facility dwell time. So often we find that carriers can kind of make up the difference if they're delayed at the um, at the pickup facility. At drop-off, that really is going to start to impact the carrier's ability to get to their next uh, pickup location. Um, and so if, if we can help reduce that that dwell time. Um, maybe it's better appointment times. Um, maybe it's just making sure that you have um, better, you know, getting carriers in and out. Could also be move maybe more towards a, a drop and hook network versus a live load unload. But those are those things also impacted, particularly that dwell time at a at the drop off facility impacted carriers acceptance across the board. Right, so it had a really significant uh, impact. I feel like I felt that first thing when you'd have certain customers that would hoard your equipment or not unload your equipment. And so now you're spending all your time finding more equipment just to run that next pickup at the origin point. And so that's such a fascinating thing for me is uh, I don't think a lot of shippers really have considered that. It's more of, well, this is a transportation provider. It's their problem. I'm not going to think about actually making myself attractive for the carriers I'm working with. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that piece of it of what is the driver experiencing at your facilities, um, getting a sense of also which facilities are particularly good or bad, I think can also help um, thinking about what that driver is experiencing. And then that leads to real business impact, right, in terms of carrier acceptance and then relying on backup carriers, relying on the spot market. Um, so, so we found that that's going to have direct impact on your costs. And so we've talked a little bit about the carrier portion. Is there any recent research going to now that shippers have the upper hand? Is there any ongoing research into seeing how will they behave now that they're the ones in control of the truckload uh, supply and there's a huge demand from all these carriers now that have entered the marketplace? Yeah, so we wanted to be fair, right? We, we've we've asked if carriers are reciprocating behavior. Then we asked, well, okay, are, are shippers? So this is kind of ongoing work, but... Um, the high level kind of results have been that shippers are a little bit more long sighted or, or looking in the long term than carriers um, in the sense that they're remembering carriers pre. So during a softer market, they're prioritizing giving more freight to carriers that had higher acceptance during that tight market. Um, so, you know, in terms of pricing, we see correlations across years, across time across market conditions. So if carrier is going to have a carrier is going to have high contract prices in one market condition, they're typically going to have higher contract prices in another. Um, and, and that kind of leads to shippers being willing to pay for something from that carrier. There's some service level, there's some potentially relationship there that a shipper is willing to pay. In terms of actual volumes or percentage of business, 
uh, shippers are going to send that more to carriers that prioritized their business in the past. So they are being a little bit more um, long-sighted in terms of reciprocating that behavior from carriers. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that that shippers, they have the business, right? They, they have a little bit more ability to be long-sighted. They know kind of what kind of customer orders they're having. Um, they maybe have a better sense of, of what their network distribution strategies are going to be. And so they they have more information to begin with. So I think they can afford to be a little bit more long, long-sighted than carriers typically are. I feel that firsthand because uh, the shipper is obviously you're, when you're given like an RFP, you're, you're projecting your demand. So it kind of fits into where their whole business process supports this demand planning. But I noticed that a truckload company, regardless of size, you almost fought each week. Oh, it's week 32. Oh, we got to get it to week 33. And you don't really have a lot of time unless you're in a meeting or something really breaks to look and say, oh, did I do well over this past unless it's like a monthly or quarterly roundup. So do you think it's maybe structurally that the carriers are, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. You're always chasing this demand, but you just can't really get caught up while the large shippers are able to think further out and actually see the forest and not the tree. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. It's carriers are, they, they have to be responsive. That's kind of the nature of this industry. Um, and I think that's also why we see this, this lack of reciprocity from the carriers because they're just responding to the the supply and demand of today and the information that they got today based on the loads that are being tendered to them. Um, but I think for for shippers, I think they they have a better sense of that that ability to plan. Now that they also struggle with that as well, right? Uh, some of the work that I do is also around uh, specifically that strategic procurement process and what should and should not go into that that strategic bid. Um, you know, how well can we actually forecast over the next year? Uh, turns out not so well, right? Um, but at least we have a little bit more information. We're basing those decisions off a little bit more from the shipper's perspective. And is that something where when you're thinking of like strategic, is that where a shipper would say, okay, I need to keep my rate with this carrier? Or it's kind of like, what things should I put up the bid kind of a scenario? Yeah, I specifically look, I'm looking at uh, some new research coming out is what should I actually put it include in the bid, right? Um, pricing is going to depend on a lot of things, which there's a lot of great, smart people working on that. I'm specifically looking at segmenting our network and saying what should even be included um, when, right? Should we procure something for a full, a, a particular lane for a full year? Should we wait until demand materializes? Um, should we do more strategic mini bidding? Um, even different types of contracts. I've done a little bit of work on, on different types of contracting, but yeah, on this, on, you know, how can we use more of the information that we have more data analytics, um, and more kind of, um, smart way to procure freight. That's, that's maybe different from the traditional, let's just throw everything out into the RFP and, um, and see what comes back. Well, I remember the throw everything out. It was uh, before Johnson Controls got bought out. I swear it was 80, it was like 8,000 or so lanes in this Excel spreadsheet. And they just threw it out there. It took like two or three months with a poor analyst to bid on it. And like, so we're thinking of, uh, uh, does that also include mode? I'm reading reports, equities analysts, folks are saying, okay, well, should I ship it LTL? Should I ship it rail? Should I ship it truckload? Is that part of this decision-making process where it's like, I want to find and save costs, but I also want to be a little more quicker in case I'm missing out? Yeah, I think that's a, a really big part of it. I, I worked with one shipper um, kind of at the summertime of the of the first year of COVID, and they did a lot of um, trying to reduce costs, reduce their carrier base in truckload. And as a result, they ended up going a lot more intermodal. Um, and, you know, we see these markets cycle and they ended up kind of getting bitten for that because um, capacity came back on, uh, became more constrained and, and their carriers came back to them and said, we can't, you know, we can't maintain these prices. So I think there's, it's really smart to be thinking about different modes, but the fact remains that the markets are going to be impacting all of these modes, maybe in different ways. Um, but we need to be smart about, you know, what kind of market are we currently sitting in? What do we think is going to happen? Of course, no one has a crystal ball to know when the market's going to, to change, but I think we need to be to, to recognize that that market condition is going to impact all modes. And so there's no kind of holy grail to just getting the lowest cost if you, if you change modes. 
That's kind of what I feel like as well. Even as we move into Q4 right now, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of no one can really figure out exactly how this plays out. Uh, is this something where, from your experience and so far with the research, have shippers been doing this internally or are they trying to partner with some of these clearing houses? Because we hear a lot about, at least on FreightWave side, uh, you know, digital RFPs, uh, load marketplaces to try and you know, combine all of these carriers. Is that stuff folks are considering or are they just still trying to figure out their own demand right now before they can even reach out? I think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, before going towards more of these um, newer options, I think shippers are still looking at kind of what do I, cur- what do I have right now? What do I expect to be having? Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of reliance on traditional methods, but I think, you know, as long as these new options are becoming more and more competitive in terms of price, I think there's a lot of shippers, especially bigger shippers, are willing to kind of uh, try new things and, and implement them and, and see how they can work together. But still, I think there's this aspect of partnership or, you know, identifying which pieces of my business make sense for which, which types of options that are available. And I, I think shippers need to be thinking about this a little more um, strategically. And I think they are. We're, we're seeing that they are. So we're maybe seeing, because that was a big, a lot of our conversation is looking for the bottom on rates now that shippers are in control. Uh, you know, when they're talking about relationships, I'm assuming now, even with this research, people are going to put more emphasis on the relationship because I guess there's a fear that if you drive your carriers out of business, you'll pay more costs in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing. I, you know, one of my my goals for this research is to is to show from the scientific perspective that you know, these market conditions really do play a big role in the prices that you're going to pay. We see a lot more reliance on on backup carriers or the spot market in tight markets, but we also see that in soft markets. If you're if you're really undercutting your carriers, they're not going to be able to to maintain that, right? And you know, whether they're going out of business or not, if their contract prices are just too below what they can, what their operational costs are, unless it's a very strategic lane for them within their network. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're bound to see rejections anyway. So, you know, you need to, the price, the lowest price possible is, is never going to be your best option. Um, unless, you know, it, you're, you're willing to sacrifice either quality or things like that. I like that. And I'm I'm excited to see as that research gets made, because I feel like it's a tale of two shippers. You have one shipper that will probably find the Goldilocks zone on rates. They want to make sure that they, you know, take care of their incumbent carriers. But then there's the other shipper who goes dirty cheap. And then what happens is brokers and other carriers undercut their lanes until they run into this problem where nobody wants to pick it up, except for maybe that one person who needs it once every week. Uh, is that something where are you all seeing any early trends in the data that maybe shippers are kind of in different behavioral subsets or have shippers kind of approached this uniformatively? Yeah, no, there's there's wide ranges of, of shippers and their strategies. And I think, you know, it, it, some of it comes down to what their objectives are at the time of procurement, right? Is it a, is it a totally cost-driven decision? Is it a quality? Is it a carrier base? Um, that type of thing. And I think what's, what's really important is for shippers to be very clear about what is their objective going into the RFP and then you know, hopefully get the objectives of that they're looking for. But first is be clear about what the objectives are. I would, I would urge shippers to not go fully cost based. um, Because as I said, you're gonna, you're gonna run into problems. Like you said, you're gonna run into even the brokers that cannot find capacity for you. um, Or it's going to be something that you're going to have to, you know, wait for, or the quality is not what you expect or things like that. So be clear what you what you're looking for in your RFP and then go into it. Um, but we see, you know, shippers being across the board on what they're looking for. And that kind of brings me up to a fascinating behavior where, uh, you know, demand planning and shippers, they'll say 50 loads per week from point A to point B. And then it turns out by the end, if it's a soft market, it's now down to 35. And I always used to wonder if that was because the shipper missed their demand because as a trucking company, now you have to go to the spot or something else. Or if it's something where behind the scenes, they're tendering it to that second or third carrier because their strategy is cost savings. Uh, Have you seen anything, especially with the carrier being focused on consistent tenders, have shippers shown anything yet that some may be uh, a goose in the numbers a little bit? Yeah, I've seen both, right? So so I've seen 
a situation where it's 50 loads per week and only 30 materialize, um, I've seen, and so it's, you know, all 30 are going to that, that, that main carrier. I've seen them split halfway. Um, I've also seen, you know, even in the RFP kind of inflating the volumes just to get a, to, to indicate to a carrier to, to take this lane more seriously. And this is kind of getting to uh, some of the segmentation work I'm looking at, which is, you know, let's be a little bit more real about the volumes, the demand patterns on each lane. And maybe that that lane that you actually know is going to be 30 loads in a year um, is now going to be, we're going to say it's 50 loads in the RFP just so that a carrier takes it seriously. Uh, but maybe that that lane shouldn't even exist in the RFP anyway. And in that case, you know, wait until it materializes or, you know, provide, you know, get it on on a, a, you know, a mini bid or something like that when you have a better sense of what that demand is going to be, because maybe it won't materialize for another, you know, three, four months. And then that carrier is not not expecting that demand because they haven't seen that demand. And then all 30, you know, all 30 loads happen in the last 30 weeks of the year. And then the carrier hasn't, hasn't put any, you know, real value on that lane until later. I've seen it firsthand. The carriers would bid it and then they would say it's supposed to be 50. And then all the pricing analysts, they're like, okay, we're good. And then fourth quarter runs around, they put a rider saying you need to cover 10% extra. And so the whole market for the poor carrier, that's the primary, gets turned upside down. And then the load planners are sitting there and suffering in silence. That was my holidays back in trucking. So I completely agree (laughs) that that kind of behavior, understanding that's so fascinating. Um, Had another question regarding trailer pools and equipment. So kind of like the old saying was, at least from my experience, was if you have a bunch of trailers, sometimes it makes it harder if the the shipper gets mad at you because you got to move them all out. Has there been any forms of stickiness or prioritization in some of the data on whether it's a live load or if I want to have drop trailers set up? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. I I haven't personally looked into that within our data. Um, What I have kind of heard more anecdotally is that, yeah, you know, it is much harder to get a carrier to change over a carrier out of a facility once they have that established, um, that trailer pool established. Um, and on the, but on the flip side, you know, for a carrier to, to be able to, to have those trailer pool, that, that equipment requirement, you know, they've invested something into that shipper. Um, so hopefully there's, again, back to measures or metrics of relationship that carriers already invested quite a bit of equipment into that particular shipper, hopefully they can kind of manage a way to maintain that relationship because from both sides, right, it's hard for that that shipper to change out that carrier. And from the carrier's perspective too, they've planned actually quite a bit of capacity in excess of, you know, the the demand because they've they've they're sitting on, you know, capacity or, or equipment at their facilities, at the shipper's facilities. So kind of coming near the end and final thoughts here as well. Uh, If you're a carrier right now and you've lost your pricing power, what are some things you can do right now just to kind of hang in there or keep your business as much as you can? Yeah, I think one is is making sure you're working with your customers, with the shippers, to to be clear about what your needs are, what are the, the important lanes to you, right? I think a lot of the issues that come up are neither side is really incentivized to be very clear with their with the information that they're offering in terms of their business right because that is very often that is a competitive advantage right so for shippers in terms of inflating volumes carriers may also be inflating the capacity that they have so i would i would urge both sides to to be a little bit clear on identifying who are your main important customers for the carrier and be clear about what your capacities are, what your prices are. Don't don't go too low, right? In terms of your your pricing, your bidding, because you know that you won't be able to to maintain that. Um, but just make sure that you're you're sharing the information that's going to help both of you reach an agreement that that works. And we got about a minute left. What is the best way for folks to reach out if they want to partner up, read the details, see some of this data? How where should they look? Yeah, so um, this is all posted on um, the MIT's uh, website that has all of our research going on um, from myself and others within the Center for Transportation and Logistics. Um, they can also reach out to me either by email or LinkedIn. All of that information, you can just Google me and, and my, my information should show up. 
Perfect, Angie. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We may have to hit you up again because I hear something about ghost loads. That may be something worth looking into as well. Yes, I would love to come back and, and share that and other research that's going on. Perfect. Thank you so much, folks. That's going to be a wrap for Loaded and Rolling, but check out the folks at MIT. This data is amazing, and we want to talk about the science. Trucking always talks about tribal knowledge. Well, it doesn't have to be a tribe. There's actually data behind it, some of the smartest minds in the nation looking at it, so definitely check them out. Uh, you can also find us. Sometimes I host Sirius, but I'll, what you want to check out is tv.freightwaves.com slash Loaded and Rolling if you want to watch it, or Apple or Spotify. I have a newsletter comes out on Wednesdays and Saturdays. When Wednesday night and Saturday morning, because what better to do every Wednesday night and Saturday morning, two times a week, and then we'll go from there. And if uh, you haven't missed out, I got to plug it. F3 comes up in November. That's technically next week. Buy some tickets. You can see me in person, perhaps, as well. It depends on what job they have me working. If I am working the coat rack again, then perhaps I will see you all sooner rather than later. That's going to be it, though, for Load and Rolling today, folks. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Thomas Wasson, and that's going to be a wrap, though. Join us next week, because we will literally be doing it live. Surprisingly, I'll be on F3. Check it out. <laughs>